I want to thank HWB Education for inviting us to come and make this presentation. A lot of the groundwork um, and including the, 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 the beautiful slides you're going to see are, are, are organized by some of my colleagues, Dr. Tia Fothergill, Professor Bernd Stahl, uh, Dr. Ingrid Unuzani at, uh, at DeMont University. I also have to thank you all for, for getting me out of my awful country and, and onto the continent. Um, it, uh, it's a real relief to be here <laughs> right now. Uh, particularly, I'm sure you can understand why. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the, uh, the ethics processes and the ethics structures in the HBP. Uh, what role we in SP12, and more specifically in ethics support, uh, play in those structures and what we might mean for you as researchers. I understand there may be a mix of HBP affiliated and non-HBP affiliate, HBP affiliated, but, but, but you can, I hope those of you who aren't necessarily do, can get to brought, draw some sort of insights into the way that we handle uh, the, the ethical challenges in the project. Um, so I'm going to start off by looking at the sort of wider ethical questions, uh, some of the sort of ethical challenges raised by the project, and then focus down onto uh, data governance, data protection, and things like that, and the dreaded GDPR. Um, this is becoming an ever import, more important ethical principle as we sort of move forward uh, into, into sort of this data-driven and information-driven era. So, oh Lord. Uh, to give you a quick overview of, of Project 12, which is Ethics and Society, these are all our fantastically handsome um, work package leaders here. Uh, we have uh, work package one, foresight and research awareness, basic KCL with uh, Nicholas Rose. This is about looking forward and predicting and being active in our, in our uh, uh, engaging with potential challenges of the future. And this, this work package has led to things like our dual use opinion, which looks at HPP research and, th and thinks about what impact that research might have upon potential uh, different applications. We have the Neuroethics and Philosophy work package headed by uh, Professor Kintinka Evers on, on the left-hand side there. And this is more about looking at the current state of, uh, of, of neuroscience and neuroethics and, and, and considering the, the state of the art and the ethics of the state of the art. We have Community Engagement uh, headed by Lars Kluver at the Danish Board of Technology. Um, and they're about engaging with the different stakeholders involved in... Um, the kind of research we do in the HVP. So that's scientific communities, that's legal communities, and that's, of course, the wider public. And how we can engage with those stakeholders and, and consider their, their, their views and their opinions and the, and the way that they view the human, human brain project and potentially feed that back into the way that we do science. And then, of course, uh, Work Package 12.4, Ethics Support with Bernd Stahl at the bottom left there. Um, that's where I'm based, I'm the um, HVP uh, compliance manager. So it's actually my job to make sure that every single task in the Human Brain Project has ethical approval in place, which is no mean feat, I can assure you. And then coordination and administration, which is fairly boring. Um, and we in ethics support have this sort of curious dual role. Uh, on the one hand, we engage in research and we are looking inwards. We sort of inwardly focus at the practice in the HVP and we're looking at uh, the ethics of the way that we do science and the ethics of the way we do the platform development and the ethics of the way we do our work effectively. And trying to feed into that some of the ethical principles that, 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 drive, that drive a lot of things like the regulation across Europe. And considering um, how we can either encourage best practice, how we can um, engage with uh, the scientific community, and we do that through a number of, of work packages. But, but in the, on the other hand, we also have a significant operational element, similar to sort of SP11, uh, where we are, um, we have a research element, but then also this thing where we almost have a governance element in the project as well. So compliance management, which I'm responsible for, again, making sure that we have ethical approval for every task in the project. Uh, support for the ethics advisory board and other ethics services. You know, this, is, this isn't just about research, this is about the actual, the fundamental structures in the HVP. The Ethics Rapporteur Programme, man managed by uh, Manuel Guerrero. Uh, outreach and dissemination, that's about, again, feeding back a lot of what we, we learn into, back into the project. Ethics-related data governance, uh, managed by Dr. Tia Fothergill, who, I dare say, made these slides. And then the Data Protection Officer, uh, Dr. Kevin McGillivray, who I'll talk about a little bit la later. Um, so much like 
much like ethics support, where we have this research and operation role, I have a research and operation role. Strictly speaking, I'm 50% compliance manager, 50% research fellow. More like I'm 150% compliance manager and 0% research fellow, unfortunately, because it takes so much of my time to do the actual, the actual legwork of, of getting, of wrangling the ethics in this project. But that's, that's just me. Maybe I should speak to HR. We'll see. Um, so, how do we do that? How do we, how do we uh, get to grips with the, the such massive range of, of science that goes in the project? You know, within this room, there must be a massive range of scientific practice and expertise, um, animal, human, cognitive, theoretical, neuroscience, as well as sort of platform development in uh, the fields of neuroinformatics. Uh, medical informatics, high-performance analytics, analytics and computing, uh, neuromorphic computing, the robotics, the new robotics platform, things like that. This is a massive strength of the project, a huge strength of the project. But the exact impact of these technologies is kind of, it's difficult to predict, it's difficult to wrangle. And as diverse as these scientific practices and expertise are, so too are the diverse ethical challenges that we face in them. From early on in its development, the HVP has been aware of these sort of social, ethical, philosophical challenges um, and has developed a set of activities to address them. Um, and these activities are organized around the principles of what's called responsible research and innovation. So that's RRI for short, which I may, I may switch between the two terms. So responsible research and innovation is an approach to governance of research which aims to unite and respond to the relevant and main stakeholders and their expectations. It builds on a long history of research and innovation governance that includes technology assessment, uh, philosophy of technology, science and technology studies and other things, and, and it kind of gained prior, uh, sort of prominence around 2010. Uh, one of the most cited definitions of RRI states that aims to ensure the acceptability desirability and sustainability of research and innovation, as well as their outcomes. That's quite an important part, not just about the actual research itself, but the outcomes of the research as well. Um, the idea of RRI um, has been embraced by several national and international funders, arguably because they see the value in ensuring that tax-funded research benefits the taxpayer. That's one of the most important principles. And although other approaches um, to research innovation governors have been employed in different regions. Uh, the highest profile adopter of RRI is, of course, the European Commission. Um, so one prominent version of RRI, based on Stilgo et al. 2013, uh, and then adopted by the UK EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, um, is, is, is what I've, I've, I've written here, the area framework. In this view, RRI is characterized by four separate but interlinking features. Um, anticipation, reflection, engagement, and re it's called responsiveness in the, in the text, but it's kind of been characterized now as action. That is to say that research and innovation activities need to consider possible future consequences. They need to have integrated mechanisms of ensuring and fostering reflexivity they must reach out to relevant stakeholders and engage with them, and they must be willing and able to respond to the stakeholders and act accordingly. These characteristics increase the appeal of using RRI in large, complex research projects, as opposed to more rigid approaches like technology assessment. Now, these activities and interactions are clearly aimed at bringing together the various stakeholder groups uh, within the ecosystem of research and innovation to ensure an ongoing, productive dialogue that allows research and innovation to be steered in ways that the participants in that dialogue agree are beneficial. Now, this is, this is quite a highly ambitious aspiration. It raises a number of fundamental, practical questions. For example, it's not exactly clear in a heterogeneous society, and perhaps an international project like the HUB can appreciate this to the greatest extent, um, it's difficult to reach a consensus on what exactly is desirable or acceptable. What would be a desirable and acceptable outcome for the Human Brain Project? And the question of who counts as a stakeholder, and so who is legitimately involved in the discussion, and then can steer this particular innovation, it's, it's a difficult, to, difficult question to answer. And then the translation of consensus um, into practical action, again, is a not a trivial matter. And all of these processes uh, 
require funds to be diverted from other objectives. But despite all these criticisms, um, ROI has been agreed that it has the potential to address some of the most pressing issues uh, surrounding research innovation and the governance thereof. Um, and this is true across most disciplines. Uh, but there has been a recognition of the, the particular importance of RRI and the particular prominence of RRI in ICT. The HPP made a commitment to RRI, um, and that commitment is reflected in the work we do in ethics support, and indeed in SP12 as a whole. If I go back a couple of slides here, you can see the reflection of the area framework in the, in the work packages. You've got anticipate in foresight, you have reflect in looking at neuroethics and philosophy, in, in looking at current practice. You have engagement with community engagement, which leaves us in ethics support as the act. We're about putting, that, putting all of the insights from these, from these different work packages into action in the project. So, the HGP is on the cutting edge of a number of fields, but being so much on the forefront of technology also often necessitates engaging in potentially ethically challenging research. The European Commission highlights in total 11 um, ethical issues in their ethics self-assessment tool. I've not listed them all here. Some of them are, are molded into one. Um, for example, human data, human cells and tissues, and personal data are three separate issues in the Horizon 2020 format, but I've listed them all in this, under the same header here. Um, in order to account for these challenges, ethics support provide, well, support uh, to the HEP in both an academic capacity, as I mentioned, um, in that we produce research which is inwardly focused and engaged on, on how we can improve practice within the project, and in an instrumental capacity as we host a number of more sort of governance-related uh, tasks like, like compliance management. So there's a number of considerations we have to cons considerations we have to consider, things we have to consider uh, when we look at the different potential challenges that we face in, in the HPP. Some of these are going to emerge more or less than others, but, but I've put a couple of the big ones right at the start. So when we, when we look at human research, when we have research involving human participants, like Egidio's work involving uh, elderly people and, and the robots, we have to consider elements of um, informed consent. And in the HPP, that might be quite challenging. It could be challenging in neuroscience research when we're dealing with subjects who maybe, maybe find it difficult or are unable to give consent. If they have significant uh, brain damage, for example, you have to think about sort of consent from other people. If they're minors, for example, things like that. But always the paramount, what paramount is the safety and well-being of the participant. Additionally, with there being an ever-increasing pressure to handle larger and larger and larger data sets, we have to make sure that the data we collect is used for the purpose for which it was collected. Which can be, dif can be difficult to track if, if we have a data set which travels from, uh, from center to center to center. Which uh, in international neuroscience, that's, that's, a, that's a feature of, 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 of international science in general, the passing and sharing of data. But if we don't, if we don't collect the data and anonymize it properly, then that becomes a problem. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later when I talk about things like data governance, data protection, so we'll put a quick pin in that for now. To address the issue of animal data, the irony is that most of you in this room will fall into two camps. Either you handle animal data or you handle animals directly, in which case some of the things I'm going to talk about in this particular issue are quite familiar to you. Uh, or you don't handle, handle animal data at all, in which case you might not find this particularly relevant. But I, um, I think it's important that every researcher in the project is aware that, that these kind of issues are discussed at the very highest level. And we have practice and guidelines in place and, and experts on the, in the project who can give you advice about these kind of things and can guide you about these kind of issues. So, what are our, what are our, our considerations when we're thinking about animal research? Well, there are specific expectations from study to study. But as a more general overview here, we're going to highlight what's called the three R's. That is, Replacement, reduction, refinement. That is to say, we expect H3 research that utilizes animal subjects and produces animal data should seek to replace animal subjects in research with non-animal subjects wherever possible. Consider things like the neurobotics platform where they have, they have these, these, uh, these simulations of, anim of animal structures. The potential for that to replace animal subjects. That's a good example of that. That's the replacement element. 
They should use methods that enable researchers to gather comparable levels of information from fewer animal subjects or uh, more information from the same number of animal subjects. That's reduction. So overall, you're reducing or keeping to the very, the very bare minimum the number of animal subjects you're using. And then refinement. You should use methods which alleviate or minimize potential harm, suffering, or distress, and enhance animal welfare for animals used. You should always be using the most up-to-date methods. Always. Now, these values are emphasized in EU Directive 2010-63-EU. And unfortunately, yes, I have memorized that. Uh, and they are standards to which we expect all HVP animal data to adhere. Now, there is one additional R that I would highlight here, and that's uh, redundancy. It's kind of the flip side. You have to avoid redundancy. That is to say, wherever possible, you should seek, you should seek to uh, avoid repeating research on animals that has been conducted elsewhere if no additional scientific value is gained. If you, have a co if you are in Germany and you have a colleague in France who's doing almost the exact same experiments as you, consider whether you're producing extra scientific value because you could be just causing additional unnecessary harm to a living being. So that's a very quick overview of the kind of considerations we have to make towards animal data. Now, uh, what do we have next? Non-EU countries. How do we ensure that data collected uh, in countries that fall outside the jurisdiction of the EU directives uh, adheres to acceptable ethical standards? And indeed, what are those acceptable ethical standards? What remit does the HUB have to govern what data it will and will not accept into its platforms? Um, and these are, these are sort of difficult questions, pertinent questions. We believe there's, there's, these, there's two extreme viewpoints, like ideal types. Neither of these are particularly acceptable. We could, we could as a sort of governance body, insist that all non-EU data adhere stringently to EU regulations and EU standards. This approach would ensure that we could be confident in the ethical standards applied by non-EU data providers. But it would severely limit the HUB to meet its scientific goals. There may be countries which have reasonable and defensible ethical principles and guidelines, but nonetheless, they don't adhere to EU requirements. And setting the bar too high would rule out that data by default and would exclude a huge amount of scientific data from the global science community. On the other hand, we could set the bar too low and we could fail to take into account the ethics of things like data protection, animal welfare. This would simplify the process greatly, but it would open the door to que ethically questionable data, bypassing ethical regulations and potentially rendering, rendering them void. Now, neither of these two positions are really possible and suitable for the HBP. And indeed, any EU-funded project that wants to meet its scientific and its ethical goals. So how do we deal with this? When in consultation with ethics support, colleagues across the project, and the ethics advisory board in 2017, it was decided that it was fair and appropriate that HPP principal investigators take responsibility to ensuring that their third country collaborators follow ethical principles in line with EU guidelines. For example, through a formal agreement with the laboratory that they will adhere to internationally accepted ethical standards, for example, like the three R's. And that should be done at the PI level. If you consider where our position is in ethics support, we're centrally based, we're a relatively lean team, which is code for small, um, and we have, we have uh, local expertise where we are, but we don't have the expertise to go into every single one of your institutions and, 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 judge, and judge each one of your projects individually. So, we devolve the responsibility to you guys. Um, finally, uh, environmental health and safety. This one doesn't come up a lot in HVP research, really. I put it up there because it's a consideration for the, for the European Commission. Um, and so, if you have concerns, there, are, there is guidelines on the, on the EC website, but it's not really something that we could, we've come across in our, in our project. Uh, dual use and misuse, here at the bottom here. Um, dual use refers to the application of outcomes that are intended for civil or uh, clinical use, but have applications in other areas, notably commercial or military. This is a difficult question. It's about responsibility. Where does your responsibility stop for the work that you're doing? Is it when you publish your data? 
Is it, when, is it two years after you publish your data? Is there, is there ever a point where you are no longer responsible for what somebody else goes and does with your work? Or are you, do you continue to be responsible for that? And if that's the case, should you be considering that at the very start of your project? So, SP12, uh, in collaboration with a number of key colleagues across the HPP, has recently published the dual use opinion. Uh, this can be found on the HPP website, and in fact I can show you it if I click on this thing here, I believe. Yes, please, I would like to do that. So this has literally been released within the past few weeks. Um, and this is the kind of work that we, that we will produce to, to provide you sort of a bit of advice. So if you have concerns and you're, and you're thinking about the kind of work that you're doing and thinking about maybe it, has, it will have applications that you don't intend, that aren't part of the work that you're doing. You're not saying I'm producing this artificial intelligence work to, to go on and work in drones in the military. I'm doing it for another reason, but I recognize that it could have applications. This may well be useful for you. I'm not intimately familiar with it, but it's available on the, um, the ethics support website. And it has a number of uh, recommendations for a number of different people. So recommendations for the HDP, for the European Union, and other social actors. So it's worth a read if you have concerns about that. But how do I get better my sleep? Here we go. Um, so, oh, and at the bottom, other issues and unexpected issues. This is a fantastic thing by the UC where they say there could be other stuff. As I said at the start, HPP is working at the very cutting edge of technology. It's, it's, it's really pushing the boundaries and it's really pushing forward to, to, to produce new and novel science every day. And there are ethical issues which have emerged over the past five, six, seven months, let alone years, that we couldn't have predicted. So, there is guidelines on the European Commission website about how you can handle those kind of things. And certainly, if you have concerns about something that I've not listed here, that's coming up in your work, Come and speak to us in ethics support, and we can probably help you through that. So, how do we how do we account for these things? What are the processes that we put in place? Well, this is this is my stuff. Oh, there's me. That's post shave, pre haircut. No, wait, the other way around. Pre shave, post haircut. Um, all new and incoming HCP tasks uh, go through the ethics compliance process. Uh, Task leaders should be aware that uh, no research activity can start until you have local ethical approval. I think that's generally accepted. People understand you can't start doing ethically challenging work in your institution until you have ethical approval to do so. That's part of people's process. They understand that. We in ethics support in SB12 are not an ethics review committee. We don't give ethical approval for you to do your work. It's not something we do. As I said earlier, we don't have the local knowledge to go out to your, each one of your institutions and make a judgment about what, whether what you're doing is acceptable and in, in line with your local guidelines and your local and uh, national uh, laws. So what we do is we devolve that responsibility to local regulatory authorities. Um, what we do is check that each task has the appropriate regulatory approval before the, before the HPP work commences. So how does that work? Well, what we do is we... Um, can we see that? Yeah. So, every task leader completes an a, uh, ethical issues and approval survey, which has been developed in reference to the Horizon 2020 ethics self-assessment tool. Um, and it's based upon the ethical issues I raised just a couple of slides ago. What this survey asks the task leader to do is detail any potential ethical issues which might arise from their research. And it provides the opportunity to upload any supporting documentation, such as the ethical approval letters, such as study documentation as, like protocols, such as consent forms, participant, participant information sheets. Now you recognize an, sort of an issue with that when we're talking about international research. We recognize that the HCP is a European research project. Each one of those documents is likely to be in the native language. So what we ask is that Instead of asking that the PR translates every single document in its entirety to English, um, we ask that only a very short summary, two to three paragraphs, of the ethical approval letters provided so we can get the key information like start, end dates, any, any requirements, any, any inclusion, in, inclusion criteria that, that, are, that are on that, uh, that document so that we can keep that in, in our records and it will help in, in audits. This isn't something that we're read, taking to bed and reading before we go to sleep. This is, this is stuff for, the, for when the EC come knocking in 2020 and then again in 2023, we can show this to them and say, look, every, every project in the HCP has ethical approval in place 
And here's the, English, here's the English summary of it, just in case you don't speak the native language. Uh, so where are I? <clears throat> all of this, um, all of this is quite, can be quite sensitive information. You know, we're talking about ethical approval letters. We're talking about ethical approval letters with um, uh, the names and, uh, and uh, workplaces of people doing animal research, which can be a sensitive thing. We've had, we've had people request that we don't store that information because, because it's still a controversial issue. So what we do is we store it on a secure server, which is very, very closely, access, closely controlled access by a small number of HTTP staff and a small number of European Commission staff. Um, all of this, the supporting documentation, the, the reviews, the, the survey, go to an uh, internal ethics reviewer who makes the judgment about whether it's, there's anything missing from it. They're not, they're not conducting a thorough ethical review. All they're saying is, is there, is there any information extra that we need to conduct any audits in the future? It's, it's a, sort of a brief uh, ethics review. And there we have a sort of a, a number of different eth internal ethics experts, uh, for example, um, uh, we have Christine Mitchell in, in Harvard, who's, a, who's an expert in bioethics. We have uh, uh, Patty Healy at Dumont University, who's a, uh, an expert in human research. Um, we've just, we had Abdul Mohammed, but now we have Kim, who's in the same department in, in Sweden, uh, looking at uh, animal research. And these are experts in the field, and they make a judgment about whether the things that we have from these individual parties are appropriate for, for the task at hand. Um, and if there's no more queries, what they do is that, well, if there are queries, they contact the PI and they contact us and we have a discussion and we resolve them. More, by and large, the, any questions we have can be answered. Often things like, for example, uh, how you deal with incidental findings in human research if you're doing medical research. These are questions which come up quite a lot. Um, and we, look, we, we resolve that through dialogue with the PI and with the ethics support team and with the internal reviewers. And once that's all complete, we consider the compliance process done. And all of this is tracked in the, SG, in the ethics registry, which is a database of HAP tasks and their approval status. That's what I manage. Um, it's both a tool for reporting and uh, a live database at the same time. So I take a snapshot, snapshot of it every three months, upload it to our secure server, and then the European Commission are able to, to view that. So they, they have an oversight on us a lot. I feel their the, the hot breath down my neck almost every day. So, so they, they, they have a quite a close, close, uh, close eye on us because, they, because ethics is important to them. Um, and and uh, I think in 12.4 in, in we might be one of the work packages that has the most deliverables to complete because we, we have a lot of reports that we write for the EC. So, they have, so we, we do keep quite a good close contact with them and, and sort of European legislature. So as the regulatory landscape changes, this might change. Processes might change to account for these changes. Similarly, as the nature of the human brain project changes uh, in the coming months and years, and anybody who's kept up with the SJ3 planning will see that actually, yeah, the project's changing quite a lot. Some of these processes might change as well. But we must change along with them to tackle new and emerging ethical issues as they present themselves. And as the sort of joint platform is rolled out, we in ethics support must consider what role ethics compliance, research ethics compliance, plays in that infrastructure. We've got to consider how data collected outside the European Union is going to be handled. We're going to be dealing with data provided by external users, not by HPP researchers. To what standards are we going to hold that data? And if it's the same standards as the research occurring within the EU, then we need to consider how we're going to monitor that considering they're not HVP researchers, these are external users in, in other countries, like on the other side of the world. So what is and what isn't practical? When I was at the summit last year, uh, Jan Biali made the, the comment that it's about finding a happy medium between what's practical and what's desirable. So we were very conscious of that. Research ethics compliance is going to have to work much more closely with sub-project 5 uh, data curation, and already my, my job in, in compliance management has been ported. My boss jokes that he's sold me to Norway, but because I'm now based in the, uh, the platform development element. So I'm working really closely with, I mean, I'm going to be working really closely with the data creation team where, where these ethics compliance processes are going to be built into that system because we're not going to be dealing necessarily as much with research in the HBP, but instead going to be dealing with external users. So we're going to have to build this kind of process into that system so that we can make sure that it adheres with the EU law. 
Finally, we, get, we have to consider the, how the compliance processes contribute to the HVP commitment to promoting responsible research and innovation. I believe that a stronger link between the compliance processes here and the fundamental ethical issues which drive those processes is important to foster a community of responsible researchers. They should be knowledgeable about the ethical issues raised in their work and they should engage with that pr this process here not as a box ticking exercise but rather as a critical reflection on the challenges of their research. So that's ethics compliance, that's my job. Um, we're going to talk about the big acronym now. Um, starting off with the sort of bit about data governance. So to tackle data governance within the HPP, we follow the principles of RRI, as I said, using the UK EPSRC uh, framework. That's the area framework. Now this vision of RRI offers a method for integrating ethics structures and processes throughout the research process and is useful for producing ethically relevant research because it integrates a temporal aspect um, and considers future implications of work through the sort of the anticipation and the reflection element. And it has a call to engage with a wide range of stakeholders uh, and actively take those views into account with the engage and the act element. So implementation of this process is intended to be cyclical with feedback from the actions continually feeding back into the anticipation. And our goal with the HVP was to try to incorporate these principles into the data governance policies into the processes and into the infrastructure of our project. So one of the things we have to clearly look at if we're talking about data governance is GDPR. Um, <coughs> let's turn the page. So the overarching aim of the GDPR is to harmonize data protection laws across the European Union by strengthening privacy rights and freedoms of individuals and promoting the free flow of data throughout the single market. In effect, it regulates the processing and free movement of personal data by data controllers or data processors by updating existing European data privacy laws and requiring organizations be more transparent about how personal data is processed and used. It's, it's kind of a comprehensive reform of data protection law. Now, the GDPR is EU regulation and is directly applicable in all EU member states. So that means it's not necessary that some of their, pro their provisions be actually implemented by national law. They are, they are implemented automatically. Now the regulation lays down rules for the protection of people, i.e. data subjects, as I mentioned on the, the, right, the left hand side here, um, with regards to processing and free movement of their data. It's brought significant change already, I think we can see that. In the processing of personal data, a lot of companies were taken by surprise with this, um, I think. And you, I think when it came into, into force, we all received the emails, the endless emails, where people were slightly panicking about what they can do about GDPR. Thankfully, in the, in the Human Brain Project, we considered it quite early. Uh, and I'll talk about a little bit about how, how we handled it uh, in a minute. Um, for research organizations like the HVP, the GDPR aims to create a supportive framework to facilitate exchange and processing of data using safeguards to ensure that personal information can be used appropriately while protecting personal rights to privacy and enhancing public trust. Trying to get the balance right, I think, has been quite a considerable challenge, and that can be evidenced by the fact that it took ages to come into force. To some extent, actually, scientific research has a privileged position in the GDPR. Uh, in that several exemptions, derogations apply. Uh, nevertheless, some data for research purposes will still be subject to the general uh, default provisions in the GDPR, and some of these duties are considerably more onerous than previous data privacy law. And of course, there is the, uh, the revenue-based fines, the, these, these, these huge money that could, could go if you have a data breach, uh, up to 20 million euros or 4% of an organization's global turnover. So it's important. <laughs> it's really important we keep, it, we keep on top of it. So I'm going to quickly run through these, these data subject rights. These are, if you have human participants, these, these are the, 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 the rights that they have to, to their data. If their data is anonymized and linkable back to them, that's quite important. If it's anonymized and linkable back to them. They have the right to be informed. 
So we're informed about what you're going to do with that data and that you are collecting the data in the first place. You know, Facebook, by the way. Um, of access. They have the right to access their personal data. Of erasure. It's the right for individuals to have personal data erased. Uh, to restrict processing. This is an individual's right to restrict the uh, to request the restriction or supp suppression of their personal data. Uh, to data portability. They've got the right to obtain and reuse their personal data for their own purposes across different uh, services. They have the right to object. So that's the, uh, the rights of individuals to object to the processing of their personal data under certain circumstances. I think I skipped one. Rectification. That's the right for individuals to have inaccurate personal data rectified or completed if it's incomplete. Uh, and then finally, uh, in relation to automated decision-making profiling, this is, this is kind of a number of different provisions rolled into one, but, um, but it's, uh, it's about keeping people informed about where, if their data is going to go through sort of automated processing. And the application of, of GDPR uh, is, is evaluated through the, the DPIA, the Data Protection Impact Assessment. Uh, this has already been done, uh, or is in process of being completed for uh, Subproject 8, the me Medical Informatics Platform. Uh, and the sort of analysis of that DPIA is underway. It's a big, it's a, a big job. Uh, and the idea is that these will be rolled out to, to the other subprojects if the subprojects still exist in SJ3 uh, once, once those, those sort of things come along. So there's a number of special, if we're thinking about research, the kind of research that we do in the Human Brain Project, there's a number of issues we I really have to be conscious of. So personal data. Any information that can be identified and identifies an individual, you have to be very, very careful when you handle it. You must consider all these, these, the data subject rights on the previous slide. Because these are the rights that the individuals have with regards to GDPR. Particularly when we're talking about sensitive personal data. Things like ethnic origin, political opinions, religion or philosophy, trade union membership, genetic or biometrical data, health data, sex life, sexual orientation. These are, these are sensitive issues and we have to be very careful when we handle these issues, you're most conscious that the way that, of, of the way that you handle them and, and the protections that, that cover them. We must consider the, 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 the challenge of anonymization. This can be really difficult to obtain. If true anonymization can be very difficult to obtain under EU law. Because um, it has to be that data cannot be identifiable in any way and cannot be linked back to the subject. And this is different to pseudo-anonymization. So I always struggle to say, and I said it first time. And this is reduced linkability, where you, you separate the personal and identifiable characteristics from the rest of the, the, rest of the non identifiable data, but, but, but you don't separate them entirely. And with pseudo anonymization, the data is still covered by GDPR, but it's more protected. Now, there is data we collect um, in the Human Brain Project which is unanonymizable. Things like Genetic data, brain imagery. If you have a patient that has a very specific set of lesions on their brain, you might be talking about one person in a million, maybe one person in a billion. It's relatively trivial to connect, that, to connect the, a brain scan of a pers that person's brain back to the subject. And of course, we have to consider uh, cross-referencing. If you have several data sets which cover the same person, perhaps over a longitude, uh, you know, a length of time, you have to consider whether, uh, when you cross-reference those data sets, whether the, 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 the individual data, of data subjects begin to emerge from, from comparing those data sets. So it's, it's not a trivial matter, and it's very difficult to, to achieve, which is why it's been such a, such a job of, of some of the processing we'll talk, and the people I'm going to talk about in a moment to get, the, to get some guidance out for, for, for scientists and researchers on the ground. So why is this, why is this important? Why, why, why should we care about this? Well, data is not neutral. It's not something simply you can pick up and do with as you please. There are cultural, social, ethical, philosoph philosophical implications for handling data, not to mention contractual, legislative. So we should be conscious of the ways we can ethically handle it. Very recently, in the news, we've seen the ethical and moral questions regarding data um, is on the public's consciousness. You know, over the past week, we've had Facebook uh, effectively duping teenagers into providing their data without fully informing them about what it's going to be used for. 
without the knowledge of anyone. And we've had the issues of things like Cambridge Analytica, the vast amount of information that we give to Google, and I couldn't get away without saying the B word, the vast amount of misinformation. It's showing my colors a little bit. So data is not simply numbers and text. Using them has implications, and using them effectively and ethically, we believe, leads to a higher research quality and social impact. Now this is, I think, a step beyond just the moral and ethical, impl ethical imperative and the ethical uh, guidelines you've got to follow. We believe that if you do that properly, it leads to higher quality research. Now why is that? Well, first off, you make sure that you're complying with all legislative and, and contractual law. You're not going to have it bite you in the bum when you, when you have a data breach. So you become somebody who's, who, who's knowledge about that, and you can continue to do your research because you don't break any contracts and you don't break the law. When you engage in consistent practice, you allow greater reproducibility and interoperability of your data. You encourage greater scientific value from that data. You allow yourselves to work with a number of different scientific um, sort of cultures across the globe if you produce data which is handled appropriately. And if you build ethical implications of your work into the earliest stages of your work, of your design, sorry, you ensure you're aware of the potential knock-on effects of your work in the long term. This is what we were talking about with the dual use element. You know, considering the potential impact of your work, you don't get bitten down the line. And all of this engenders trust. You gen engender trust in your research group, in your discipline, in your institution, in the HBP, and as well as science in general, amongst the wider public. And you become a researcher and a research group or an institution that is trusted, that is safe and solid. And that leads to a higher quality of research. Um, and we're taking account of these, of these elements, and we're providing guidance, and we have structures in place. So who are they? Well, more faces. Look at them. Fresh-faced, eager. That's because it's probably early in the morning and not after a long day. Um, these are some of the sort of key data governance people in the project. Uh, Dr. Tia Fothergill, uh, data governance working group chair. She presented very similar presentations to this in Sofia last year. Um, she's she's an ethics expert, um, so she's kind of focusing on the ethics of data governance. Professor Bernd Stahl, who's the ethics director of the project, sits on the SIB, sits on the DEER. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's the man. Uh, Professor Jan Bialy, who's the co-chair and the leader of SP5, also I believe sits on the DEER now and uh, part of the SIB. Uh, Florent Gaillard, who's the, another co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group uh, and ethics rapporteur for SP8. And then um, Kevin McGillivray, uh, data protection officer, um, appointed last April, I believe, and I'll talk about his role in a moment. So these are some of the people, if you're looking for guidance, these are the, these are the real guys. Uh, they know their stuff. So in 2017, the uh, Ethics and Society, along with the EAB, the Ethics Advisory Board, that is, and the, uh, produced the uh, Data Protection Opinion, which I can show you in a moment. And this, this opinion led to the establishment of the Data Governance Working Group, like I mentioned before. These are a cross-SP group of experts in data-related issues and representatives of every sub-project. They create data policy, which is relevant uh, to the entirety of the HEP and is subject to the approval of, uh, of different governing bodies, after which it's implemented at the level of institution. So this is to be, this is to be taken down to, to, to the institution at the partner level rather than, rather than necessarily at the, at the HEP level. It serves as a forum for discussion and deployment and sorry, development of policy, which supports and enabled compliance with things like the GDPR. Um, they're not a decision-making body. They're not like the science, science and Infrastructure Board. They're not like the Directorate. We create policy, and that goes on to these approving bodies to be, to be implemented. So, some examples of the things that they've produced. Uh, things like the... Uh, data policy quick guide, 
the um, data management plan, terms of reference to the Data Governance Working Group, uh, and uh, the upcoming data uh, audit committees, which may be coming. But perhaps most importantly, uh, and this is kind of a re very recent triumph, this has been a massive amount of work that's gone by Tiff Othergill and Kevin McGillivray, and, and, and if I do say so myself, uh, and a lot of people in the Data Governance Working Group, is the data, um, data Policy Manual, which Believe me, in maybe three weeks, you will be sick of emails about the data policy manual because it's been a huge amount of work and it, and it's, it really is sort of the, the Bible of data governance and data protection in the HVP. This will be coming around relatively shortly. Um, but if you want a quick reference guide, then the data, data policy quick guide is, is the thing to go for. And all of these things are available on the, uh, on the ethics resources website. Uh, the data Group's work group also, the members, are uh, they provide feedback back to the subproject, and input from the relative subprojects back into the data governance working group. Um, so you can see that's almost a, a mini version of the area framework, anticipation, reflection, engagement, action. Um, and they provide expertise and input into, uh, into HTTP specific GDPR compliance processes. They make requests and provide contributions and contextualization for data protection related materials, which is relevant for SPs, uh, and platforms in general. So they produce things like uh, compu uh, cloud computing guidelines, um, GDPR documentation requirements, email as personal data guidance, and terms of use for the HPP website and HPP website policy, and things like that. So, oh, and also coming out of the, <laughs> I almost forgot to mention Kevin, he would have he would have been very annoyed. Uh, also coming out of Data Protection Opinion 2017 was the suggestion to appoint a Data Protection Officer. Kevin McGillivray, apart from being incredibly overworked, is an expert on GDPR. He's the, he, if, you want, if you want one, if you want one, one point of expert advice, he's the guy. And he has a, he has a, a contact page on the HTTP website if you're looking for some information about GDPR. He really knows this stuff. Um, scarily so. He wrote his whole PhD on it, so he knows this stuff. Okay, so these are the ethics and data governance structures uh, in the HTTP as they exist. Um, they, as I said, they're subject to change with regulations uh, and with the project changes in SJ3. And hopefully, if they do change, we're going to be able to come do presentations like this where we can give you a bit more of an overview of the way they change and some of the expectations we have on you as researchers when you engage with them. Um, the idea is that if we engage with people like yourselves, scientists on the ground, researchers who know their stuff, then we can foster a community which is ethically curious, that's ethically knowledgeable, and perhaps most of all, responsible for the kind of work that they do in their project. So, thank you very much.